Welcome. My name is Giselle, and I'm the Senior Occupational Therapist at the Queensway Carlton Hospital. Today, I will be outlining what to expect when planning for a hip replacement. The information in this video is for people who are having a lateral or posterior approach for their surgery. I will be reviewing the hip anatomy, give a brief review of the total hip replacement surgery, the do's and the don'ts post-surgery, and how it affects your function in daily activities. You will also have a list of information that you need to gather before your visit with the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist. This is a planned surgery. Be organized. Plan ahead. It is all in your hands to ensure that the surgery is a success. You will be discussing with the occupational therapist the setup of your home, your support system, possible discharge issues, and what equipment is required. Please make sure you have a paper and pen to jot down the equipment recommendations during your virtual visit. You will be visiting the physiotherapist who will review your present ambulation abilities, recommend your post-op mobility device, how to do stairs, demonstrate your exercises, and what to expect post-surgery. You will be scheduled for a pre-op appointment. The hospital booking office will contact you to schedule this appointment before your surgery. The pre-op appointment is where you will see the nurse, the anesthesiologist, have some blood drawn, and review your medication list. Arthritis is one of the many diseases that can affect the bones and joint of the hip. It is the result of bones becoming worn and grinding against each other, causing pain and difficulty moving in the joint, which affects your walking, sleeping, getting dressed, and so forth. Your hip is a ball and socket joint. The head of your long bone, called the femur, fits into a socket in your pelvis. An incision is made through the skin and possibly your muscle to get to your hip joint. Your surgeon can access your hip from the side or the back. Your surgeon will let you know which approach is best for you. The round head of your femur is replaced with a stainless steel head or ceramic head. A matching plastic cup is placed in the socket of your pelvis. Then once this is completed, aluminum staples are used to help keep the incision closed for healing. It can get wet so you are able to take a shower. You will have a dressing that will need to be removed when wet and replaced with a dry one. When your surgery is over, your body starts to heal itself. Around the new stem of your hip, the body is creating bridges. In between these bridges, your body is depositing bone. Around the muscle and skin, there are also bridges being formed and collagen is being deposited. It takes six weeks for the bridges to be strong enough to hold everything in place. It takes 12 weeks before healing is complete. This is why there are three rules for three months. You have to follow the three rules strictly for the first six weeks to allow for healing. Then follow them another six weeks to help the body get stronger and healthy again. Follow these rules at least one to two weeks prior to your surgery so they become more natural and it will make it easier after surgery. Presently, there are a lot of hip movements you may not be able to do due to pain and lack of joint mobility. After your surgery, you will regain some of the movements, but we want you to follow the rules to allow for healing time and prevent possible subluxation or dislocation. Let's start with rule number one, the 90 degree rule or the no bending rule. If your shoulder goes in front of your hips when you are sitting, you are breaking the 90 degree rule. If your knees go higher than your hip, you are breaking the 90 degree rule. Think of it this way. You need room for a cereal box on your lap. Place the corner of the box in your groin. If you lean forward or raise your knee higher than your hip, you will no longer have room for the cereal box. Let's talk about things we do every day. We all sit. When sitting, your knee cannot be higher than your hip. You need to measure the distance from the floor to the back of your knee and add two inches or five centimeters to know the minimum height of all seating surfaces. Depending on your height, the therapist will recommend what you need to add to meet the correct surface height. It could be a foam cushion or furniture risers or nothing at all. It could be a wedge cushion, but at times patients find they slide down from it and it is not comfortable. You need to sit on a firm chair with arms. Before you stand up, 
you slide yourself forward by placing your hands behind your hips. When getting up, we tend to lean forward and then we break the bending rule as the shoulders are in front of the hips. You need the arms to push yourself straight up without leaning forward. You cannot use a walker to pull yourself up as it will tip. Therefore, it is best to sit in a chair with arms. You cannot sit on a sofas, chair with wheels, rocking chairs, nor Muskoka chairs. The best chairs to sit on are Queen Anne chairs or the captain's chair from a dining room set. Some lazy boys may be appropriate if the 90 degree rule is not broken. Please measure the height of your seat of your chairs you plan to sit on so that the therapist will know what equipment to recommend. You can also take a picture of yourself sitting in your favorite chair to show us. Not all toilets are the same height. You need to measure the height of your toilet. This will assist the therapist to determine what type of equipment you might need on your toilet in order to respect the 90 degree rule. We usually recommend an over toilet commode as you can adjust the height to suit you. Please view the bathroom safety video for more details. Usually a bath transfer bench is recommended for bathtubs and a shower chair for the shower. This will be reviewed and demonstrated during your visit. Please make note of where your shower head is so that the therapist can suggest which device will be appropriate for you. If you have a built-in seat in your shower, measure the height. Now let's look at getting dressed. You have to sit while getting dressed. You cannot lean over to put on your socks, shoes, or pants. This is a reacher. She is your best friend for the next three months. You must have this with you at all times, attached to your walker or your crutches. You can use it to reach the TV remote. What happens when you go to the bathroom and your drawers fall down to the floor? You cannot bend over to pull them up. You need to use your reacher to pull them up. So don't forget it in another room. Most people need a 26 inch long reacher. A 32 inch long reacher is for people over six foot two. The rule to put on your pants or underwear is bad leg on first to get dressed and bad leg off last to get undressed. You reach down your pant leg to bunch it up. You put the reacher in. You see the black thing here? Follow this with your toe so that you get your foot into the pant hole. Once you see your toes, unhook the pants and then grab onto the waistband and pull up your pants to your knee. You then do the same with the other leg. Place your walker in front of you. Once both pant legs are up to your knees, you can stand up to pull them off. If the pants fall down, use your reacher to grab them from the floor and pull up. After surgery, we recommend that you wear pajama bottoms, sweatpants, cotton or polyester pants. Jeans are too rigid, and may rub more onto your incision. Now how would you put on your socks? This is a sock aid. You put the sock aid inside your sock. Pull the sock up about three quarters of the way up. Leave a little slack for the toes. You hold on to the handles, drop it to the floor. Slide your foot in and wiggle your foot to the end of the sock aid. Pull the sock aid and your sock will come up. You can remove your sock by using your shoehorn or the end of your reacher. You need a long shoehorn that comes above your knee. Shoes must have a close heel. Slip-on shoes are the best. If you have a lace-up shoe, do not put the laces up to the last hole. We recommend that you stand up to put on your shoes so as not to break the 90 degree rule. Start practicing using the dressing techniques at least one to two weeks prior to your surgery. Make sure you bring the device's label with your name to the hospital for after surgery so that you can dress yourself. Rule number two, the adduction rule or the middle rule. Let's make pretend that you have a line down the middle of your body. You cannot cross that middle line. My forearm is your leg and my elbow is the hip. When you cross that middle line, you see that your hip pushes out. We do not want to see that as you could dislocate your hip. Women tend to cross their knees and men tend to cross their ankles. Do not do this. You need to practice not doing this. It is a difficult behavior to break. When lying in bed, if you turn over to your side, your leg will cross over. You need to sleep with a pillow between your knees. You can use a knee pillow or a regular pillow 
but it has to be firm, ideally knee shoulder width apart. You do not use a pillow under your knees. Let's talk about sleeping and getting in and out of bed. You can lie flat on your back or turn on your side. You will not want to sleep on your operated side as it will be uncomfortable. Also, when lying on your sides, we compress the tissue which does not allow for blood flow to promote healing. If you do happen to lie on your operated side, do not stay for more than 5-10 minutes as you want to avoid tissue compression. Sit down, push yourself back with your hands placed behind your hips. As you slide back onto the bed, your legs will follow. Then lift one leg up onto the bed and then the other. Place your knee pillow between your knees before lying down. To get out of bed, you can do it in two ways. If you have strong enough stomach muscles, sit up and slide your legs over to the edge of the bed until your feet touch the floor. If you cannot sit up, roll onto your side while keeping your pillow between your knees. Now put your legs over the bed edge, push with your arm and elbow. Gravity will bring your legs down and your arms push your upper body up. Then you get into a seated position. The last rule is a no rotation, no twist rule. You have to imagine your body as one unit. You cannot separate the upper body from the lower body. An example of not twisting is when we go to sit in a chair or on the toilet. We twist to see if the chair is still there. If someone calls out your name, you do not twist to look behind you. You turn your whole self around. Now let's talk about things we do every day. Cleaning. You are limited in what you can do in order to maintain your hip precautions. You can dust, do the dishes. You should not load the bottom shelf of the dishwasher. Prepare meals ahead of time and freeze them. You cannot put things in the oven. You cannot reach down to the bottom cupboards. Bring the common things up higher. Laundry. Do not pick up your clothing from the floor unless you are using your reacher. If you have a front loader, you throw your clothing in. You pull it out with your reacher. Same goes for the dryer. If you have a top loader washing machine, you can put and take out your clothes easily without breaking the rules. Do not change your bed linen. We tend to break all the rules when doing this task. This is for three months. Do not vacuum as you may twist in bed. This is for three months. Arrange for someone to walk the dog and change your cat litter. You need to have the food and water bowls higher in order to be able to fill them. Otherwise, you need to get someone to feed your pets. You cannot drive for four to six weeks if you are having a left total hip replacement. You cannot drive six to eight weeks if you are having a right total hip replacement. If you drive a manual transmission, then it will be six to eight weeks no matter which hip is being replaced. You cannot drive if you are still taking narcotics. Make sure you find alternate methods of transportation during this time frame. Roll the window down so that you have something to grab onto. Place a cushion on the seat to fill in the bucket. Place a plastic bag on the seat in order to make it easier to slide, especially in the winter with heavier coats. Recline the seat. Push the seat all the way back. Back up until you feel the car behind your legs. Reach your hand back and place onto the dashboard. Sit down. When lying back, you can bring your hip up to clear the door without breaking the 90 degree rule. Have someone help you to get your legs in if needed. Once in, position the seat back, but still leave it slightly angled back. The same to get out, but the opposite way. You should contact your insurance company and make them aware of your hip replacement and to find out when you can return to driving. The physio will let you know what ambulation device you will need post-surgery. Almost everyone should be walking with a two-wheeled walker. You cannot use a four-wheeled walker as it moves too quickly. Some of you may use crutches and the physiotherapist will advise you on which is best for you. You should walk with your assistive device until the physio advises you not to. To measure the proper height of your walker for you, stand up tall, drop one arm along your side, Measure from your wrist to the floor. The handle height of your walker, crutches, or cane should be at the level of your wrist. 
When walking with the walker, we do not do the wedding march. You have to step through with your foot. The reason for this is to gain a normal walking pattern. As your muscles get stronger, the physiotherapist may graduate you to a cane and then possibly nothing, depending on the strength of your hip. Do not be afraid of stairs. If you live in a multi-story home, someone will need to carry your walker up and down the stairs or you will need a two-wheeled walker on each floor. You will go up one step at a time holding onto your cane or crutch and the handrail. A way to remember is to keep your operated leg lower, meaning when going up the stairs you lead with your good leg. When going down the stairs you lead with your operated leg. Your cane always stays with your operated leg. If you do not have a handrail on your stairs then you will need someone to help you. Now that you see how these rules may affect your daily activities, we highly recommend that you start practicing and living these rules at least one to two weeks before your surgery. After your surgery, we will make sure you have your equipment. Of course, we will be asking you about those hip precaution rules. You will walk, sit up for meals and snacks, and practice stairs if needed. We will often ask you what the three rules are. Remember, B, T, and C. No bending, no twisting, no crossing. What to bring to the hospital? Your street clothing, good walking shoes, toiletries if staying overnight, your two-wheeled walker or crutches, as well as your reacher, sock aid, and shoehorn. Please make sure all of your devices are labeled with your name. Most people go home on the same day as their surgery. This is best practice. Your surgeon will talk to you about your discharge day. Plan where you are going to stay once discharged. If you decide to go home, we recommend that someone stays with you for the first 72 hours post-surgery. Afterwards, you need to consider how and who will make your meals, help you with the groceries, clean your house. Or, you may want to consider going to a convalescent care home. Most people stay 10 to 14 days or longer before going home. You have to organize this stay on your own and it is at your own cost. What happens at discharge? You will need to follow the rules for six weeks. When you see the doctor at the six week mark, ask how strictly you need to follow the rules for the next six weeks. Continue your physio exercises three times per day. The exercises that you will have to do at home are demonstrated on a separate video. You can also find them in your booklet. You should have your first physio appointment several weeks after surgery. Use all of your equipment until advised not to. Before your first visit with the occupational therapist and or physiotherapist, please have the following information. The height of the toilet, the height of the bed, the height of any chairs you plan to sit on, the side your taps are in your tub, the number of stairs outside and inside your home and which side the railing is on the height from the floor to the back of your knee where it bends while sitting. You have a few options of where to go for your post-op physio. If you are returning to Queensway Carlton Hospital for your post-op physio, you will be given your outpatient appointment day and time before you are discharged home. If you choose to go to another public funded care site, we will fax the referral for you to your chosen location. They will call you to book your appointment. If you have not received a call in a few days, please call them directly. You can also use your private benefits to have physiotherapy at a clinic of your choice. In this case, you will need to call the clinic yourself to make the first appointment. You will need to tell the physiotherapist at your prehab one-on-one -on -one assessment the name of the physio place you have chosen to go to. We often do surveys to improve patient care and programs. We would appreciate you taking the time to complete these surveys. Thank you in advance for helping us to improve your care. After watching the video and reading your booklet, Please jot down any questions you may have so that you can ask us during your visit with the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist. We hope that this video answered most of your questions.
please refer to your total hip replacement booklet for more details. We wish you all the best and a speedy recovery with your hip surgery.